Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben Arnott, and I'd like to welcome you to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast, Australia's first barbecue podcast. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast, leave a review, and share it around to spread the love. If you're into competition barbecue, you might be interested in my free ebook, 27 Lessons Learned from Competition Barbecue. I've drawn on my experience as both competitor and judge to offer you exclusive inside knowledge to help you make the most of your competition experience. Head to smokinghotconfessions.com slash comp dash ready to get your copy now. There's also a link in the description. Today, I'm chatting with Chris Davey from Smoking Hot Bros from Brisbane, Queensland. In the 2016 season, the Bros took out fifth place overall, including finishing up second place in beef at meat stock in Sydney and first place in both beef and lamb at the Blues and Barbecue Festival at Port Macquarie. To put it in perspective, there were 48 teams competing at Meatstock and a whopping 84 teams at the Blues and Barbecue Festival. To pick up first place in two categories is just truly phenomenal work. Check it out. This is the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with barbecue pitmaster Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? Thanks for joining me in the confessional today, Chris. So the first thing that I have to know is, what was the last thing that you barbecued? The last thing I cooked up was uh, some awesome lamb cutlets and some pork ribs. Cutlets. All right. Now, did you did you buy them individually or did you do the whole rack and then... Uh... Uh, no, certainly not. No, we actually, um, from our butcher, um, super butcher, we actually uh, buy the whole the whole rack complete with the um, back on and we actually trim them down, French them and shape them to our desire. Oh, okay. All right. So you, you grill the cutlets individually then or you like roast the whole rack first and then slice them at the end? No, we um we don't grill. I actually uh, just low and slow. Um, I actually I actually don't grill my lamb cutlets. I like to take it to medium rare, and basically, yeah, eat them like that. Just yeah, not a big fan of grilled. Any particular reason for that? I like charcoal. <laughs> <laughs> well, not 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 on the food anyway. No, not on the food. Not on the food anyway. <laughs> um, the flavour of charcoal is not my um, preference, but uh, yeah, it's just the way I've always cooked them and found them to be uh, my favourite. Awesome. Awesome. So is that your specialty then or is there, is there another dish that really stands out for you? Um, yeah, lamb is one of our specialties. Um, it has been one of our um, more favourable at comps uh, and also brisket's probably one of our strong, strong categories for us in this last season. Um, yeah, probably uh, pork uh, ribs as well. We've had some, some good fortune with as well, um, but those two mainly, the lamb and the brisket, are probably our favourite ones. Oh, righty Okay. Brisket. That's interesting. I always find brisket to be a bit of a hard one for me. I, um, I think it's partly because my family's not real fond of it. My wife and son, are, they're not a big fan of it, so I don't get to really practice it real often. All right. So um, the Smoking Hot Bros, mate, how did it all come together? Uh, the founding members, we were, um, or we are, sorry, uh, a couple of good mates. We all enjoy barbecue and uh, a couple of boys went out to a demonstration day and basically just fell in love with the, the food itself and from there uh, we all just got together over what we usually do most weekends having a couple of beers and catching up and decided to hey let's get into this and a couple of pro cues and a couple of char grillers and UDSs later and turn into offsets and more offsets and more pro cues and more verticals. And yeah, it, it, it kind of grew from there basically. So that's how we basically formed was just a group of mates getting together, enjoying a bit of good cue and some, uh, quite a few beers. It's, um, it's quite the rabbit hole, isn't it? You start with one and then you get another one, then you get another one. And then before you know it, you've got a, a trailer mounted smoker and you're dragging it everywhere around the country. And it's, uh, it, when it gets you, it really gets you. It does. It, it really <laughs> does. It does hook you in. And once, once it grasps you, you can't let go. It's, mm. it's definitely addictive. Now I, um, on the topic of your, uh, your pits, I've mm. been doing a little bit of Facebook stalking through your profiles. And I, I, I mean, uh, research into your, uh, into you and the team. And I can see that you guys get pretty attached to your pits. Do you have names for them? And, um, what are the names and how does one name a pit? Uh, we do get very attached to our pits. I think it's, um, I think you need to be one with your pit uh, to understand your, um, your machinery, your, your, 
trying to meet with, but uh, we basically we haven't really named many of them as a such. Mainly the ones we've named is probably our our first trailer we had, which was uh, Smoky McSmokeface. I think there was a, uh, a boat getting around that won a competition called Boaty McBoatface at the same time and uh, we thought it was quite catchy. Yeah, yeah we thought it would be quite catchy to call it Smoky McSmokeface. So that was our first trailer pit. Uh, and our latest uh, weapon, um, our big BSG, we've uh, just recently called it Rockatansky. I did see that on, on Facebook. I thought that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and the way people uh, uh, understand and look at us in a weird way, but uh, it's more of a reference to Mad Max with the um, the Road Warrior. Exactly. And, uh, Max, uh, the actual Mad Max himself, his name is Mac, uh, Max Rokotansky. Uh, so it's basically uh, he is our Road Warrior. Uh, if anyone has probably seen our photos of our pit, um, it does look like something out of uh, Mad Max, all black and black on black. I've, I've, I've seen the photos, mate. That, that trailer has been made to eat highway. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a thing of beauty. And it's, um, the, the name you've given it is so Australian because I think aside from Mad Max 1, which from memory from back in the days when I was in film school, I think uh, they only ever actually referred to him as Rokotansky in the first film. Correct. I think I think in the other ones, and then in the the, the latest remake, um, they they only ever refer to him as Max. And in the latest remake, I'm I'm not even sure they even uh, they even did that. Because I'm pretty sure he was a policeman. So that's he's a, he was Constable Rokotansky. I'm he, pretty sure from the first movie. He was. That's uh, right. Yeah. yeah. So that's where it came from. So that's what uh, our pit's named after. So he is Mad Max. Beautiful, beautiful. So, um, have you always been into barbecue? What's your earliest barbecue memory? Uh, well, like most Australians, uh, I've definitely been into barbecue uh, in different forms. One another, um, probably more recently, um, before it was long and slow. I really used to do a lot of Sunday roasts and cooking, and you know, have the mates around for dinner and. I was quite fortunate to have a my old house to have a great yard and I used to do a um, char grilled um, uh, rotisserie. So I'd have, you know, your chicken or pork shoulder or something onto the rotisserie and, you know, you crackling on that. So I'd have a lot of mates over a few drinks and, you know, and finish the weekend off with, you know, a bit of a feed. And uh, from there, it really, like I was explaining before, we, um, yeah, when we formed our little team we just grew into hey let's do let's have some ribs for dinner let's uh let's have some big shorties let's have some chicken let's and then it just turned into hey, let's make our own sauces let's make our own rubs and hey let's do a competition so uh, it just snowballs really so my f- earliest memory uh would be probably with my dad uh, as a child as a young kid helping him out, carrying out the snags, the barbie, while he fires up the old four burner and basically, you know, hot oil in there, smoke everywhere, lamb chops on the side and there's quickly, you know, 10 minutes later you're running through the grass with bindies all the your feet, running into the back, back into the house and stuff a bit of bread on, a bit of sauce and, yeah. It's probably how my first memory of barbecue was, was um, back then. Mine much um, the same, mate. Mine much the same. And, yeah. and all, all, all four burners on the four burner had to be going flat out all the time. Correct, correct. <laughs> you that and then you pour one, probably half a bit, half a stubby on top just to keep, just to cool it back down again. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Except, except it used to be called marinade. Oh, sorry. That I, was don't, what I, I don't think. That was what my dad always used to say. He'd say, I'm, 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 I'm just marinating it. And he'd, he'd pour <laughs> beer over the top of it. That's awesome. So what is it, um, what is it that's, that's drawn you to pursue excellence in barbecue? Because you guys are right up there on, on the ladder at the moment. So why, you know, I mean, there's, there's a big step from, um, first of all, backyard to competition barbecue. And mm-hmm. then there's a massive step to, uh, from saying, hey, I'm going to go in a competition to I'm going to go in 10 competitions and I'm going to give this everything I got. So what sort of drove you to take that big step from, you know, let's, let's go to the local comp and with a couple of mates have some fun to mm-hmm. let's really give this a go? Uh, good question, Ben. Uh, we, I think all of us in our team were just really competitive. We're very all you know, very competitive in our nature. I have been as well personally throughout my, my, my life with sport. Um, 
we we enjoy each other's company. We have a great time. We I think a lot of people in the scene know us as the guys like to have a bit of fun. Uh, we like our loud music. We love our loud music. You know, and we love a good sing along. And we are not shy on you know putting our horrible voices out there and just really ripping into it. And I think we found after you know after the first couple of comps that hey you know it's serious and we know when to be serious, but we also know when to have fun. And I think that's the balance we've where we've really managed to control. And it just it's addictive. And once you get that first call up, I guess it's um you know from there it's like hey you know this is this is a lot of fun. And you know in the few times we haven't been called up, it's we've we've still enjoyed ourselves and had a great time. Uh, and we look at back those times. You know we we look back at the times of oh the food was great. It was more so that. Hey, remember that time when you know someone fell over and burnt themselves, or you know when that <laughs> when when the parsley box was this absolute mess, and or you know, you know look how drunk you got that night, or just something silly, something something silly that happens is more so our memories of barbecue and how much time we enjoy our company is um, more about highlights for us than actually. Um, the competitive side itself. So I think that's what really pursues us in in barbecue. And just the fact that we've been quite lucky in, you know, in our barbecue and uh, I think that helps as well. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what really pursued us in barbecue is just do better, be competitive and have fun. Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. Now you you mentioned luck before, but I'm not so sure that luck has has <laughs> has uh, had, has too much to do with it. What is it that um, what is it that that makes the Bros Barbecue unique? Um, a lot of research. Uh, I do believe there is luck involved. Uh, it's down to obviously with the judging as well, a lot of categories are subjective to taste and texture. And a lot of times it's hit and miss with some judges on that particular um, criteria. We basically, um, we, we've put a lot of time and effort into our, uh, into our cooks and research into our flavor profiles um, and what needs to be, um, you know, proficient for, um, you know, the taste and texture content so we really work we've worked very hard on those aspects and and spent a lot of money and time and perfecting those as well so yeah it, it, it is some luck but it is a lot of hard work too and a lot of money as well so <laughs> definitely definitely how, how many competitions have you been to this year um i've personally been to so far at uh, this point in time uh, eight uh, will be nine after kangaroo valley uh but the boys the team itself has been to 10 this year 10, Ten competitions Ten comps. that's a that's a pretty significant investment i know that um the, when i've gone to comps it's cost me like a grand per comp um so that's a that's a pretty significant pretty significant investment into the game yeah, it's um, it, it's 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 all in for us pretty much. So um, it's kind of scary to see how to look back and see how much we've all spent. Um, it's it's yeah, it's scary if you put in that perspective. Uh, yeah, it's worth it, man. It's so much fun. We enjoy it. We have so much fun. It's comps. We we really do. So it it is worth every cent we do, and we do put into these. And it's a lot of time from uh, away from family and friends and work, and it does cost on that side of things, but it's what we love and it's what we want to do. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I actually find that my wife and son love to come to the competition with me. My wife ends up on the team and my son ends up grabbing the, uh, pretty much anything he can find business cards, t-shirts, whatever. And he runs around the crowds, handing them out. And all these people end up laughing, seeing a little four year old running around, handing out, uh, things. He he loves running up, handing out business cards and saying, barbecue ticket, barbecue ticket. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah, it's good to get the family involved. That's great. You're listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with barbecue pitmaster Ben Arnott. Okay, so Chris, we're here tonight to talk about um, uh, essentially offsets versus verticals, which is, um, for me, a fascinating topic. Uh, yep. 
offsets seem to be the favorite, but to me personally, I, I prefer verticals. Um, so the first question that I want to ask you on this topic then is what are some of the pros for cooking on an offset? Well, uh, pros for cooking offset, um, depending on, on the size as well as um, your real estate. Um, real estate can always also be a huge factor in cooking on an offset. Secondly, uh, cooking traditionally with iron bark, as if you're using uh, charcoal and fruit wood, um, I, I just personally find it's um, it's something we prefer to use um, for our cooks. Um, it's really down to um, catering as well. If you're doing like the catering commercial side of things, uh, it's also that presentation that that stigma of having this big huge chunk of metal look at this thing it's just nostalgic it's huge it's beautiful uh it's great to have that sort of um aspect as well um offset's great because you can actually versatile um especially in direct flows you can actually uh with the heat as well you can direct a lot of uh heat uh to your wherever you're cooking and whatever shelf you're cooking on you can actually control that a lot easier than some other styles of uh, smoke, um, offsets. So that's what we've found as well. So are there any cons against cooking on an offset? Uh, definitely. Um, one is probably um, having, especially for competition, for example, uh, meat stock for us this year, we had, <coughs> excuse me, we had three 20, 20 inch offsets on a uh, trailer. Uh, which was uh, quite heavy and quite a mission to unload and load uh, with um, wood and just set up and tents and floor and just little bits and pieces. It was actually quite, uh, it was quite full on. Um, we found that at that point in time, we really need to look at changing our method of traveling to Sydney from Brisbane with three offsets on a trailer to try and compete at one competition. But at the time, it was what we had and what we were um, proficient at using and what we were happy with for those. And it paid off for us. Uh, it did cost us a vehicle. Um, one broke down halfway uh, and did put a strain on the other second vehicle, carrying the rest of the gear. Um, but we did make it and we had a great time as well. So um, for that, we found that the cons against it is obviously um, – Basically, it's a lot of room, um, a lot of um, the weight. Uh, a lot of them can, you can get up from you know your two, three hundred kilos up to you know obviously your trailers up to close to eleven hundred, twelve hundred kilos as well. Um, what is a, like that. What does a twenty inch weigh? Um, well, um, my old twenty inch. Uh, which um, I just recently sold, uh, that weighed close to 300 kilos in itself. Um, just a, a one point, uh, yeah, one point two chamber, um, 20 inch offset. Wow. So you had three of them on a trailer. That's, that, that's nearly three a ton on a just so in the metal, just for the smokers. Just in the metal. Yeah. And then Plus you had gear. all the gear. Yeah. The wood, the gear, the, Wow, and you said it. Yeah. You said it. It, uh, it it cost you a vehicle. What did? What does that mean? Uh, so basically, we had two vehicles going down. Uh, one vehicle towing the trailer, the other vehicle towing. Oh, just basically people and uh, utensils and tra uh, another uh, UDS. Uh, I think a couple of um, pro cues we had as well. So we're really loaded up, and uh, yeah, about halfway down, he uh, unfortunately blew a head gasket, and uh, yeah, luckily he had. Um, good cover and fortunately I was able to uh, get the vehicle towed back home and uh, we managed to all squeeze into the one vehicle and reload all the gear onto the uh, trailer and and the ute um, and make our way down to the Sydney and back. Wow. Wow, that, that would have been uh, a uh, very expensive competition to go to that one. A long day, very long day. <laughs> uh, I think in total it took us 17 hours to get to Sydney. So big trip. hours. Wow. What's a, a what's a regular trip? It's about what ten hours, isn't it? Uh yeah, anywhere from ten to twelve hours, I believe, is um is quite standard. So yeah. Wow. <laughs> Brittle. Yeah. Well, another thing we probably have cons against uh an offset. Um I would probably say um getting a starving 
it can take a long time to get it started. It can, I know for our pet to get up to cooking temp, it could take an hour to, before you want to cook, you know, if you want to quickly just whip up a quick meal. Um, I find it's easier for me to get my Weber going. Um, so I would actually mm. just, um, to get our pet to temp, set up the baffles or fill the water pan, get up to temp, get it started, get the iron bike going, yeah, it's a good hour. So before you're ready to cook. So if you come home from work, you want a quick meal, it just takes too long. So sometimes it's better just uh, not like the pit and like the weather. Yeah, I, I don't actually own an offset myself. And that's always something I've, I've kind of wondered is when you're just cooking dinner at home for yourself mm, mm. and you've got, say, you know, a two and a half meter trailer mounted offset, <laughs> do, you, do yes. you really crank that up just for you, the missus and the kids? Like, no. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's something you don't really – it sits in the garage. It's actually quite a, um, a tight fit into my garage, the uh, smoker. So to actually pull it out and uh, light it up is actually quite a mission uh, with everything packed in so tightly around it with all the comp gear. Um, it is actually quite a mission. So to be honest, to have a quick meal at home, yeah, it, it's um, definitely not that efficient to be honest. So it's the weekend cooker only. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. All right, so with um, with so many Australian manufacturers of smokers trying to stake their claim at the moment, the next topic is going to be pretty controversial: standard or reverse flow, and why? Very tough question. Um, obviously, I've uh, experienced both, uh, cooked on both, and and they both work very well uh, in a commercial sense. I would probably lean towards uh, reverse flow as a great option um, for catering. I've used, for example, we did the uh, a big cook for the Brisbane Exhibition this recently this year, and we used a uh, reverse flow as one of the pits, and um, we found that it was actually a brilliant standout unit. Um, just the versatility of the different range of temps throughout the pit, we could actually really pump the heat up and, and, and actually control it in one spot and then rotate the meat round um, from on and off. So we actually looked, um, put through four and a half ton of beef short ribs through a reverse flow over four days, 24 hours on the clock. So um, for that sense, um, it was great on fuel. Um, it didn't require a lot of um, fuel to keep it maintained uh, and it did keep that temperature and recovery quite consistent being um, the baffle is actually on the bottom um, and actually opened the doors and the recovery was very quick. So that was one great um, thing we found with the uh, reverse. But in competition sense, we found that uh, the zones are too um, too diverse. There's so many um, heat zones we found in the reverse flow um, and to control them is very limited uh you think the only control that we found you can have is either the fire or um, maybe water pan in certain spots um to try and control that heat and as soon as you put food in it it completely changes the flow as most offsets um do uh that was the reason why we personally went to a standard or a direct flow unit it was where we could actually adjust the baffles um to control uh, to a certain Certain elements of cooking from commercial to competition, um, we found that we can get uh, within five degrees across a two and a half meter pit um, with a standard flow by just adjusting baffles, which is fantastic. It's actually amazing. Um, and even just by slightly moving one or two baffles, we can create a hot spot for, say, chicken or you want to finish something off that needs to be done in a certain time frame. And it, it's, it's quite easy, simply as I open the door, move, pulling out the drawer and just adjusting the baffle with a, with a glove or a, um, a poking or prod stick. So that's, the, that's what we found with um, reverse and standard. Um, there's many manufacturers out there now that um, do both and do both very well. Um, but we just found that standard for us is just a, a, better, um, a better system. Um, Another strong point we found with um, standard, I think a lot of people very <laughs> may disagree with me about this, is that we find that we get a better moisture control throughout the pit with a standard flow yeah. rather than reverse. Um, we find that the, um, the water pan gets a better heat from being directly sitting on top of the um, deflector plate 
at the front of at the end of the firebox, and we find that with, with the with the draw of the actual pit and um, the natural draw of the pit, the moisture gets carried through the pit a lot more consistent, and we we find that we get a better um, moisture level through our meat um, rather than the uh, reverse. So interesting. Yeah, it's everyone's. Yeah, it's 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 different. It's just something we've found with um, cooking on both units. Um, both do a fantastic job. Um, both you know, can produce the same. I think it's down to the um, obviously the pit master themselves and whoever's steering and um, you know understands. Like I said earlier, uh, understands their machinery mm. and knows how to run them. So it's just time and practice. I just want to come back to something that you said before. You said that there was a five degree difference. From one end to the correct. other on a two and a half correct. meter pit. Now, that's correct. Thirty inch, thirty inch, two and a half meter pit. Now, is that in Fahrenheit or Celsius? Well, that's Fahrenheit. So, what's that in Celsius? That's like two degrees or something, isn't it? Correct. About that. So, two degrees across a two and a half meter pit. That's that. That's just blows my mind. That's phenomenal. It's amazing. It is, yeah. it is something we um, we couldn't believe as well when we started uh, breaking in um, our trailer. We, we, we couldn't believe it either. And uh, to find out how consistent it was and even with food in, uh, we expected the temperatures to really change and jump around. But to be honest, I think it was maximum 15 to 10, 10 to 15 degrees. Uh, it changed when uh, it was fully loaded with food. So really remarkable. Yeah, that's that's incredible. Um, okay, so when people are looking at at uh, ordering an offset, for example, one of the extra costs when you're designing and ordering it can be an insulated firebox. So, mm-hmm. can you explain what exactly does that mean? How does it work, and is it worth the extra expense? Uh, what does it mean to have an insulated firebox? Yes. <laughs> Uh, insulated firebox is basically um, so you have an inside skin uh, metal. So our firebox um, on our trailer pit, uh, it's insulated, and we have a six mil inside skin, and then we have a another a thin layer of um, it's a high density, um, high heat reten- uh, retardant foam, dense foam, uh, which. Um, I'm not quite sure where he gets it from, but it's amazing. He can basically put a blowtorch on it and literally two seconds later you can touch it again. It's it's amazing. So and NASA, it, 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 it comes from NASA. It, it's NASA. It's NASA. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's made from NASA. And um, and also wrapped with the outside of another six mil um, um, skin as well. So in total it's 42 mil thick of firebox completely all rounds so which is quite amazing um and we've we've used a a similar offset another three meter uh sorry a two and a half meter 30 inch offset trailer and for instance for um we went through in one competition three milk crates worth of iron bark and uh, recently at Manning Valley, in its first comp, we went through one and a half milk crates of wine bike. So just the, um, the proof in the heat, um, you know, really, really conserving that heat, we, we find that it's using a lot less. We're rolling on the meat a lot, lot less, um, sorry, the logs on um, a lot longer between time frames. So instead of being hard every half hour, putting a new log on, we're looking at every hour. Uh, it's a big difference, especially in a catering instance. I'd find it, it's it's quite cost effective having having that as well. So um, for for a home cook, I, I, I wouldn't really be too concerned about having insulated firebox. I'm not sure what the cost would be for a standard firebox um, or having say an eight or ten mil firebox. Uh, I think personally, we would stuff something for. Um, more so the catering commercial side of things for us in the future that we're looking at something's going to be more fuel efficient and um, easy to maintain. Okay. All right. So just to sum up, that was a 50% fuel saving. Did I get that right? Correct. So we've, yeah, we, our very first, our 20 inch offsets, for example, um, for that Sydney comp that we went to, uh, meat stock, we took down just under, um, yeah, probably just, just over half a cubic metre of iron bark. 
and we pretty much bought nothing iron from three twenty inch offsets. Wow. That's a lot of iron. That's a lot of iron. <laughs> um, and they are just a standard um, six mil um, or, or a um, quarter inch steel offset. So they were quite thirsty to keep off the temp. Uh, mm. Then we went. Uh, we've tried this um, uh, other brand. And we cooked on a comp and, you know, like I said, three three mil crates worth, which we found fantastic. We thought it was a brilliant. Uh, and then they had a 10 mil uh, inch loaded firebox on and even then we were amazed. Um, but to go to one and a half mil crates, you know, yeah, in a full cook was just something else. So, yeah, I, I definitely think it's worth it. Um, a lot of people are against, oh, no, against it, but I disagree with what, um, with what I say with um, insulation, saying that we don't need it in Australia. It's not cold enough, but I think the proof's in the pudding, to be honest. Well, so. Exactly, yeah. I mean, you know, one of, the, one of the, things, the first things we look at when we buy a car is fuel economy, isn't it? So, I mean, economy no matter what it is, is still a factor in whenever you're looking at purchasing something. And uh, yeah. a lot of these smokers are big ticket items. So if you, I mean, if you, uh, economy does need to be factored into those decisions. Mm. Completely agree. Mm. Completely All right. Agree. So then, as I said before, I uh, had been looking at things on Facebook and I saw that you also have some verticals in your arsenal. So could you tell us what are some of the arguments for verticals? I think it's like anything. Uh, um, I think like you said for yourself, um, you prefer a, um, a vertical over an offset. Um, affordability is one. Um, I'd say I think secondly is real estate. Like I think for a competition, um, say, um, Loading up a vertical on the back, in the back of a car or, or a ute is a lot more uh, efficient than trying to hire a trailer or obviously trying to load up a smoke for yourself or your small team. Or It's more practical, I guess. Um, we, find, um, we, we find verticals to be quite consistent in their cooks. Um, we use the uh, – we have a UDS, homemade UDS, which we um, – which uh, Jerry in our um, – one of our teammates who's just recently left to Canada, he, um, he pride and joy is made himself. Um, we used to use that quite often. Um, and actually every comp he was out, we used it. Uh, and also the um, BSG, we um, vertical, we um, one of our new teammates um, purchased and uh, it's been fantastic on the blower. Um, it's just, it really holds its temperature. It keeps that moisture level quite well. You do get a few hot spots around from where the heat goes around the water pan, but we find that it's just, just a really good consistent cook and the real estate in them is actually um, it is second to none. The, um, the amount of room you can, meat you can put in one of those verticals is amazing. I think it's, you've got more real estate in a vertical um, than a 20-inch offset, which is quite remarkable. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, um, I first saw the, uh, the BSG verticals at Brisbane comp, um, right. earlier this year and I just got a massive crush, just got a huge crush on them, <laughs> especially the big one, especially the big one. Yeah. I haven't, I didn't actually get to see the, 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 the tall boy he made, uh, but it, it, once again, yeah, he's really put in, um, a lot of homework into these verticals and they've proved um, quite well with double barrel um, as one of their arsenal. They have a, um, I believe it's a half insulated um, vertical. I'm not sure how that works, but it's half insulated and um, they swear by it. So, and they've been using it for quite a while now. Um, a lot of, a lot of other teams use it as well and had quite good success on them. And um, I do believe he's about to um, release a new model coming out so next year, uh, which is a fully insulated uh, um, uh, vertical as well, which he's um, informed me a couple of days ago that he's going to be releasing. And he's very excited about and uh, he says he's going to give those big pro cues a big run for their money. So look out. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Pity, pity it's not coming out before Christmas. I could put it on my dear Santa list. Oh, mate. I think, I think like anyone, mate, we're all... Uh, our, our Christmas lists are full and, and work's, gonna be, <laughs> yeah. work's not going to allow it to happen. So. Yeah, yeah. All right. So what are the, um, what are some of the weaknesses of, of verticals then? Um, well, 
with verticals, um, like personally, I, I, I personally prefer to cook on iron bark. Uh, but weaknesses probably with charcoal as well is um, one is the using fruit wood and charcoal. It, it is a bit more expensive than just plain old iron bark. Um, it's, I find um, opening the door all the time to for the vertical, you you can recovery can be a bit slow in some different models. Um, you know, filling up the water pan all the time and keeping an eye on that. Um, they they can be more subject to fires, uh, fat fires in the water pans as well, depending on what you're cooking. Um, <laughs> if you run the water pan dry. Yeah, we have seen it happen a couple of times. It's, um, um, I've, I've done it a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, I, I will admit it. We have done it a couple of times as well. Um, there's not many, too many cons about them, um, to be honest, because they're, they're actually a really great unit, and, and I do recommend to anyone who's, who's looking to buy one. Um, I, I think they're just a really good all-around unit, um, and, and they're just something that anyone could really just – who's learning from a beginner to a competitive level. So anyone can have a go at them. Anyone can just, you know, once you understand the basic methods of um, fire management um, and controlling your heat with um, you know, different air, with air control, and uh, I think anyone could really do really well on one. So to be honest, there's not many a lot of cons about them. Um, Probably another one would be um, a lot of them made from quite thin material. So your heat retention is another thing you'll lose uh, quite quickly when opening doors um, and you need to keep the fuel up to them. But like I said, a lot of these ones come out now, these pro cues and bits and pieces are uh, with insulation and uh, thicker steel. You're going to have a retention in them and you're going to get probably a good – I heard of rumours of um, close to a 20-hour cook on one basket of charcoal. Now you're talking something. about the um, the the Pro Q stretch, right? Versus say the Frontier or the XL. It could be. I've I've never actually used the Pro Q um, personally. I've obviously seen them, but I've never actually cooked them. But I've heard that they um, um, they do these long stint cooks um, on just one basket, which is absolutely amazing. And to mm. be able to have that, like I said before, um, you know. It's all cost effective, and you know, if you're not filling up the, the basket full of charcoal or you know, getting your um, your kettle going to, to keep the heat up to it, it's, it's something that's going to be a lot easier if you're cooking, especially with competition as well. You, you, if you've got a blower set to a certain temp, you just, you just got to kick back and enjoy the cook. So, yeah, well, I um, I hear a lot of people saying that they're worried about like thickness of metal, and uh, yeah. I've, I've got a first generation. Pro Q Frontier, and uh, so it's it's little, it's thin, but I can load that basket up, and I go mm. to bed. I go to bed at night time, and I leave it to cook overnight for eight hours. And I've got a uh, like a Maverick thermometer set with alarms, so if anything does yep. go wrong, that it'll wake me up. It's yet to actually wake me up with an alarm. That's awesome. a problem. I I love it. I just go to bed. I get a good night's sleep. It's beautiful. So, uh, yeah, that's that's just my personal experience with the uh, with the ProQ uh, verticals. Um, awesome. Yeah. So, I guess on that particular topic, then of being able to cook through the night, having cooked on verticals and on offsets, which would you say is the more efficient of the two? Oh, good question. Um, I still think the offsets are more efficient. Um, well, our new trailer is probably more efficient um saying that now um just going by what the the fuel we've been going through it's just phenomenal so yeah efficiently i would i would actually say an insulated firebox um offset is more efficient than a um than our vertical at the moment but i'm yet to try the insulated um version or, or a uh, pro q version of the insulated one so Personally, I'd uh, go with the offset, um, but I, I got a feeling that the verticals with their, their um, these twenty-hour cooks with one basket would probably be the more efficient way of going. I think that's that's going to be uh, some pretty pretty impressive stuff there. The uh, I think I saw the shanks with a with a stretch. I think that I think that was them with their coconut uh, coconut briquettes. If I've got that right, I think I that, have read. Uh, uh, yeah, I believe that that is correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty impressive stuff. All right, so um, 
uh, you travel around to many competitions in a year and we've briefly mm-hmm. touched on transporting barbecues. Now, <laughs> which design, vertical or offset, is easier to transport on the whole? Oh, well, definitely vertical. Um, like I was saying before, verticals you could easily um, pick up ProQs, Webers, uh, UDSs, BSGs. You know, there's a simple pack down, clean up, pick them up, put them back in the tray. I think that's definitely an easy way of attending competitions, definitely. Um, but for us, I like the fact that, you know, we can just hook them on the trailer and go. Um, everything's in there. Um, we just set up a couple of days beforehand and hitch on and go. So I, I, I like that option. I guess that that that's a big um, a big uh, a big difference there is whether your offset is trailer mounted or not, isn't it? I mean, if you were trying to load, uh, you mentioned loading three offsets onto a trailer before. I mean, if you were mm-hmm. if you're looking at loading up three offsets on a trailer versus um, a couple of verticals on a trailer, you know, just so we're comparing apples to apples. Mm-hmm. Um, to my mind, the verticals would win that because you'd be able to fit more verticals into that same space as three offsets but if your offsets on a trailer that's got to win hands down doesn't it definitely uh it, i wouldn't compare three i would never compare three offsets onto a trailer uh again that was uh, uh that was horrible um <laughs> that, 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 that was, i don't know where that thought came from to do that idea but um yes yeah, definitely um i think having a trailer mounted um, to a trail mounted pit is definitely a great investment. Um, we love ours. Um, I would, I, I love the, the way it, it works. It cooks and try, it just everything about it. It's, it's great. It does use up a lot of room in the garage, I will admit. Um, it is hard to fit another car in beside it, uh, but I wouldn't have any other way. Um, I, I prefer cooking on, let me know, yeah, I prefer cooking on offset. So, yeah, I think trailer mounted. Uh, trailer mounted all sets by the way to go for us mm. yeah. now you you mentioned um, where the smoker lives at home which sort of leads into my next question so mm-hmm. what do you okay you've already told us that, that that yours lives in the garage at home so does the team divvy up all the other smokers like how, how do you store them how do you um, divvy up that responsibility in that space I think I've kind of adapted the uh, the setup responsibilities of our team. Um, I think that's come down to my OCD and being organised. Uh, I like to be in charge of setting up and how things pack down and, you know, clean up. And, and, and I, I, I think the boys know that I, I have my place for certain things, um, just to be honest. Uh, so, yeah, we basically, everyone brings a certain amount of gear that we use for competition. Uh, we do use a couple of verticals, as we spoke before, you know, they take them home, they clean them up. But most of the time, we all team up the day before or the day of we get home and, um, you know, take all the gear off, clean it down and as a team. You know, it just what more hands make light work and do everything we can to get everything packed away as quickly as possible so we can go home to our loved ones and obviously shower after two or three days of being grubs. So it's mm. um, basically it's a, team's, it's a team's responsibility and we all do pitch in. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. I actually find, um, you, you mentioned cleaning before. I actually find I always end up covered in ash when I try and clean out my <laughs> pro Q. I end up, I, I get a garbage bag and I try and open the garbage bag and then fit the garbage bag over the top of the, the base yeah. of the pro Q and then tip the thing upside down into the bag and then poof up into the air goes the ash. And I end up, uh, I end up looking like Doc out of Back to the Future. Um, so what's, uh, what's easier then for cleanup, a vertical or an offset? Uh, believe it or not, offset. Uh, we have a sliding drawer, a tray for ours. So once we're finished and everything's burnt down, we actually put the hot um, – any hot embers left into a bucket, cool them down with water, and then the rest of the, the ash we just basically pull out in a tray tip it into the same bucket and carries the bin. It's It burns down to pretty much nothing. So I find cleaning out the um, firebox 
in the um, offset a lot easier than the actual vertical itself. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite a messy job in the old vertical because you like fat that stick it tends to run down and water and kind of sticks to it and it, it can be a bit messy. So, yeah, definitely I'd go offset. Yeah, you end up with that nice layer of ash sludge across yeah. the bottom of the uh, of the, right. the vertical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about That's the right. actual cooking chamber of the offset? How are they to clean? Um, I use, I don't literally clean it. It's essentially, I would use a paint scraper. So I'd basically pull everything off, clean all the tra- um, all your shelves out, um, use a wide brush um, just to wipe off the excess um, sauce and fat that's stuck to the, um, the mesh itself and baffles clean them to scrape them down and same thing with the actual um, pit itself, the actual um, cook chamber. And I'll just scrape out any excess fat and just wipe it over with a... Um, uh, a couple of paper towels just to soak up any excess fat and that's it. So just to keep that um, seasoning, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't use any chemicals inside it, so I don't believe no, in it. No. Uh, I believe in that flavour. It, it, you know, the more you cook, the more flavour you get from your pit and um, we want to try and keep that. At the same time, you don't want to, you know, dirty carboned up doors and, you know, stacks and that, you know, which can actually fall onto your food while cooking. I do have say um, yeah. from from another pit at home. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something we we try and keep on top of anyway. Yeah, right, right. Okay, so final question then before we uh, open up to the lads that have joined us tonight: um, yep. offsets or verticals? Which are the best bang for buck, and what would be your recommendation for a first barbecue for a first time competitor? Um, I would, once again, I'm leaning towards the, um, verticals for the best bang for buck. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, great example, like you mentioned before your frontier, um, they're a great little unit. You, you know, you heat up the kettle, you put the bus, you put your, um, your coals in, you put your water pan in, you let it heat up a bit and you just control the vents and just let it go. It's, it does take practice like anything, but they are simple, they're easy, and if you use the right fuel and the right free wood and the right methods, yeah, you can't go wrong. Uh, uh, same thing with the verticals. Um, from this example from BSG, they're very similar. They, they're a great little unit. You've got so much real estate. Um, and once again, if you just watch your temperatures, uh, maybe invest in a blower um, to control, control that the heat and maybe do a snake um you can do a snake system in the in the basket you can go all night without even touching it and uh it's, I'll, I'll, from anywhere from being um you know you begin to see uh, professionals um i would definitely recommend probably a vertical mm. or a water smoker awesome this segment is proudly sponsored by coastline barbecues and heating With stores in Oxenford, Southport and the Tweed, they are the Gold Coast's only Weber specialist. Okay, so Chris, now we have some some all gentlemen tonight. They're they're all lovely gentlemen that have joined us today to ask you some... uh to ask you some questions of their own. Uh, one fella hasn't been able to make it to us, so I'm actually going to read his question out to you and we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. Now, at the end of the questions, I'm going to ask you which you think uh, has been the best question tonight and uh, the winner of that is going to get a $25 gift voucher from the podcast sponsor, Coastline Barbecues and Heating. Uh, they've been very generous to, uh, to, to sponsor this podcast, so uh, we just want to give a quick thanks to them. All right, Dion would like to know, what is the biggest lesson learned from competition cooking that has helped your backyard cooks? Ah, good question. The biggest lesson I've learned from competition cooking is definitely timing, timing our cooks. Uh, I've worked now that I can actually do a home cook and plan myself for, hang on, I've got the block starting in half an hour. Or, or, no, I'm not going to make it. So... Just things like that. I, I've actually learned t- timing from starting the pit to finish to plating. I know how long it's going to take within 10, 15 minutes on most proteins now. So that's one thing that has helped a lot. Also fire management, um, anything from starting a fire or loading charcoals to um, how much I need to grab for the night or how much I've got left to be able to make a quick meal. Um, I can quickly judge that just by giving a quick glance or um, 
knowing how how much I need to put on for the whole cook or how much fuel I'm going to use. So that's been one fantastic um, element I've learned from doing competition cooks. It's definitely, yeah, time and fire management. I would definitely agree with that. Um, I think that uh, definitely timings um, would absolutely help at home. Um, the missus always gets very upset when I uh, say dinner's going to be ready at a particular time. So she invites some friends around and then I end up serving at 11 o'clock. So uh, <laughs> learning, learning and perfecting fire management and, and right. timing, it would definitely, definitely make home life a lot more pleasant. <laughs> Correct. I think we uh, we had a um a practice cook uh, uh, on uh, a few we- a few like a months ago now. When we first got our trailer and uh, we said, "Hey, let's do a let's do something fun. Let's do a competition cook as per time as like hand in times and everything." So we're like, "All right, let's get the food." So we got everything that we're going to cook for that comp, and we said, "Right, let's do let's do the brisket, let's do the pork, let's do the lamb, yeah, let's do the whole thing properly." and it turned into a mess. We were all <laughs> finished work on Friday and we were, all, we were all tired and one of the boys said, oh, I can't do it tomorrow. I've got to work now. I'm just going, all right, so we're, we're committed. We're doing this. And one of the boys just got drunk and passed out and left me by myself. And <laughs> I was like, I've been working all day. I've been up since 5 o'clock in the morning. I don't want to do this, really. We do this enough. Why are we doing this now? And a comp time. I'm like, come on, guys. So... I managed to three at three AM in the morning, I was on my last legs, woke up and put one of the mates up and said, Hey, take over. I've got to go to bed. He goes, Yep, I've set an alarm for twenty minutes, I'll make sure I wake up. And um, lo and behold, I get up at um, six o'clock in the morning and the pit's pretty much out. So oh. uh, a twelve hour cook turned into a probably fifteen to seventeen hour cook. So yeah, time management and fire management is pretty good for that one. So you pretty much dare say that our hand in times for that day was uh, a long way out. At least um, you didn't lose the meat though. No, we didn't lose the meat. So yeah, that yeah. was pretty funny. But um, yeah, we failed our hand in times for that comp at home. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty funny. Awesome. Awesome. Jared, how are you doing, mate? Would you like to ask Chris your question? Um, what got you started into low and slow barbecuing and then what drew you into the competition? Um, yeah, good question, Jared. Um, we, were interest, we were introduced to low and slow by um, a couple of our founding members, um, Jerry and Dan. Um, we basically they went they did a um, went to a demonstration cook one day and then they just couldn't stop talking about it. I remember I remember getting these phone calls from these guys and they're pretty much yelling over the phone, going, "You got to come over. We just had these ribs and my hands. They smell this delicious sauce and the smoke and meat. It's amazing. Let's try it." And they couldn't stop talking about this for oh, for hours. And they're like, not being rude, but the, or sus. It's like, smell my fingers, and I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. It's awesome. <laughs> We've got to try it. So after after that day, um, yeah, we, the boys they bought their first pits, and yeah, we all got one, and then we all started cooking, and they were the worst ribs in the world. I think they put so much brown sugar on them, turned into pretty much um, mollies because they had was like just horrible and burnt, and just we thought they were the most amazing thing in the world, um, but. Uh, it was, it was it was pretty funny. So we we, we we realized that we were onto something amazing and we could do a lot better. So we practiced and then we bought offsets and like I touched on earlier and we said, hey, we, we can do this. We went to a couple of comps and we I went to a, a, one of the first Burley comps ever and all the other boys did and we went to that first Brisbane one as well and we were literally thinking about competing and, I think that's set in stone after that first Brisbane comp, but um, that small one they had in Fish Lane. Mm. And we, we were there watching the guys going, we can do this. What's, why, why, why don't we do this? And we literally were just about to pick up our new offsets and we said, you know what, let's do it. And we booked into Bangalore and that was our first comp. And, yeah, from there we just hadn't looked back. It's, like, it's been amazing. And... Hey, look where we are now. We've literally started last year. Like, loosely, we started this last year. And I was just doing the math in my head, and it's 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 not even eighteen months from uh, no, from the first Brisbane comp to now. And you're you're right up 
you know, what are you in the top three at the moment? So that's, um, it's, it's just phenomenal. It's lucky. We're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt, you're up. What is your question for Chris? Uh, right, Chris. So in your experience in comp work, what's been the, uh, the most difficult protein for you guys to master? Um, and uh, have you got any tips for like beginning competition uh, teams that are, that'll help them along with that difficult protein? Yeah, great question, Matty. Um, we we found uh, the most difficult protein for us as a team has been uh, chicken and ribs. Basically, we find that the judging has been solely based on sauce, not the cook. Uh, that's how we feel. Personally, um, oh, it's another crack at the judges here. Uh, I do hope this does change in the next coming seasons, but uh, we've found these two categories have been very hit and miss for us. Uh, it's just, you know, we've handed in um, certain in certain comps what we feel has been absolutely amazing, uh, and we've tried a lot of Q in our time, and we've tried a lot of other people's Q as well, and we, we look at them and go, they, how, how did that, how, why? And it's all down, it's also subjective, and especially um, with the knowledge of barbecue with these judges as well is probably a, another sore point um, with flavour profiles and taste. So I think that's what's been difficult for us was trying to get that medium, that happy medium with the judges on what do they want? Do they want it basically falling off the rib or do they want that perfect bite? They they say that if you get that perfect bite, you're going to do well and, you know, that's what they're aiming for. And we have achieved that many a times uh, with both chicken and, um, and ribs. But we seem to be just not getting that score that we need to do just to get us over that line, just to get us that bit extra. Or we've been chopped down quite severely by... Um, quite a low scores and we, we look at each other and go what have we done wrong back to the drawing board let's try again and we've tried many cuts and styles and textures and you know I think now we've finally come to what we're all happy with and just sticking to it now and just refining it so that's my advice is if you're happy with a flavour and a sauce and a butter stick to it refine it and master it don't don't jump around and get, try different theories and methods. Mm. You can certainly try it for a while, but um, the worst thing you can do in a comp is experiment. Um, I'll admit we have done it before, is uh, go in blind and try something totally different. Hey, let's just try this. Yeah, why not? Let's have a crack at it. See how it goes. Um, yeah, it's kind of silly to do, but, um, yeah, I, I would basically focus on those aspects is – that's my advice in a comp on something that you f- I find difficult is basically, mm. yeah, work on those. One, one point, if I can just jump in there, and I just want to make is that just talking about judges, um, that, mm. is, uh, that is an issue in the scene at the moment, but you've got to remember that the scene is only, the scene is only two years old. So low and slow as a style of cooking in Australia as a, as a general public, we're all new to this. And so when it comes to saying, you know, what flavor profiles do judges want? A lot of the time, they're not really sure what they want. They just know whether they like or don't like what's put in front of them on that day. Um, we're still at the point where a lot of the judges in competitions are brand new. Um, yes. because, because the comp scene itself is so new and low and slow as a style in Australia is so new. Um, I think we're going to see um, as each year it turns out more comps, turns out more judges, and particularly with the new judge training that's coming out next year, I think that's really going to see a lot of these uh, issues resolved. Um, so I, I think that that's going to be good and it's going to give us all something kind of uh, level pegged that we can all – aim towards I think which is going to be pretty awesome Pit Master Mike I've just noticed your name that you've given yourself down there at the bottom of the screen Pit Master Mike what would you like to ask Pit Master Chris uh, thanks Ben uh, g'day Chris um, and congratulations on your success so far this year um, mate, I've seen you guys at a, at a few comps this year now and um, I've seen you competing on um, yes, pretty much three three different um, big offsets um, being the Bullhead Creek Pits the uh, radar hill pit and the now the your new BSG pit. So um, 
without being too controversial, um, can you give us, I guess, the, the pros and cons and, and maybe even which one of those has been your favourite based on your experience? Very touchy subject, uh, uh, Mike. I'm happy to answer, mate. We've, um, we've been very fortunate this year to um, have some good opportunities to be able to use all these pits. Um, they're all very different in, in each other. Um, they all very have the great points. And they all have their low points, of course. Uh, with the Bullockhead Creek, we were um, very fortunate this year for Craig to give us a, um, a trailer for the majority of the year after our debacle with our three pits to the next stock. And, um, you know, we were looking for a way of, you know, obviously getting to these competitions and doing some of these private cooks with friends and family um, you know, on a more economical scale than try and load up these 20, these three 20-inch 20 offsets. So Craig was really great for us during the year to give us a 24-inch a, a 15, um, 1500 um, cook chamber, um, a single-door trailer pit. He, um, he he was really, really um, great for us for the year. And we, we liked the trailer. It was great. Uh, you know, direct flow. Uh, we we, we customised a Yoda-style baffle plate for it uh, with him. Uh, we, we found it was... Um, it was good to use, but I wouldn't. Um, I, I wouldn't really be using it for a competition style of a cook. We found the um, similar to some of the other smokers we've had to be very, um, very hard to manage with a lot of food in it. Um, I'm not sure if it's to do with the draw of the pit or whatnot, but for de- definitely for value for money, it, I would definitely look at a Bullockhead Creek if I was doing something for you know a bit of catering, um, you know, a few cooks for a few friends, or you know just. <laughs> Just, just a few cooks here and there, basically. You can pull it out of the shed or leave it. It would be a great pit itself. Uh, the Radar Hill, obviously, absolutely stunning pit. Um, everyone knows Rob. He's been one of those guys who's at every comp in the scene. He's definitely one person who... Um, very friendly and genuine. I've, I've always got time for Rob. I've always got time to sit down with him and, you know, have a chat and have a laugh. And, you know... He's one of those people that you could really get along with well. Uh, he, he, he really um, wanted us this year to, to look at a radar hill, uh, which we seriously did as well. We, we, we really did as a group come together and talk about what we want to buy. And as a group, we all decided that from our experience that we wanted a direct flow pit. Um, basically from what I explained earlier in our chat was um, we found that um, yeah, direct flow suited us better. <laughs> And unfortunately, at the time um, when we did approach Rob and talk to him about it, it wasn't to be. So, um, yeah, he was obviously reverse only. Um, until lately, he released a direct flow. It lasted, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, he, um, yeah, he, his pits are beautiful. They are stunning. They are something uh, just an absolute masterpiece. These guys really do punch out a beautiful, a beautiful unit, and they do sit well on the back deck or you know at comps. They everyone. As you see, all the big teams, a lot of big teams are using them and they do quite well. And look at the meat sweats. The, you know, they are probably arguably the best team in the country and one of the most um, competitive teams around. And, you know, obviously they are one of the, the first guys to use a radar and they swear by them and they do really well. So it's all in the beholder of the, um, the pit. Mm, I've often know. said that the, uh, the, 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 the radar hills are the sexiest offsets in the game. I, I do agree. Um, I, I do agree. They are quite a beautiful unit. Um, and the BSG, um, I, I first came across his trailer, um, Dan um, Dan Midgley from BSG at the Brisbane Comp, which I was talking about earlier, that first Brisbane Comp they had there and met him there and he had his very first um, offset there with um, Boulevard. And we um, we didn't know anything about him at the time. He only just started up his own business. And from talking to him and watching him grow and um, checking out Josh's pit and learning more about his um, how it cooks and how it runs and that from many comps he's been at and been lucky to be neighbours with him uh, a couple of times, uh, we've learned that, you know, it's the way what we want and how we want it. And we love his style of um, bits as well and how he builds them and his passion and his science he puts behind them. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but we actually have um, a, left, a left-hand smoker trailer. We have, a left, we have a lefty. A left-hand what, sorry? 
So our firebox is mounted on the left hand side of the pit of of the pit, not the right hand side. Yeah, but it sounded uh, like you said left hand what? Left hand swing, uh, did you say? <laughs> yeah, we, we have a left they call it a lefty. So our pit, if you were to open your doors, if you're facing your um your cooker and you're opening your doors, majority of the pits are on your right hand side. Your firebox would be on your right hand side. Ours is on the left hand side. So and our stacks are on the right hand side. So the opposite side. Now I questioned, uh, I actually asked a question to, to Dan and I said, mate, um, I noticed our pits on the other side. Um, is there a, is this a mistake or is this? And he was quickly to, um, to remind me that uh, all the pits that have been made, they're all designed and trailers have been designed for American roads. They're all American design, American based. So the weight and center of gravity is actually, you know, for the other side of the road. So if you look at the, um, of course, look, because because roads are sloped down right, through the camber of a road, right? Yeah, yeah. So the center of gravity is actually, um, you know, it, it actually if say for instance a tire we had a tire blow out, um, if the trailer was on the other, if the weight was on the other side, it would actually naturally pull you off the road, depending on which side the wheel fell off, obviously. Um, but also I find turning corners, like a roundabout or doing U-turns, the weight is actually on the inside, not yeah. the outside. So the weight or feeling wanting to roll or pull away, um, it just sits better and actually tires a lot better as well. So um, that's another reason why we went with Midgley. His um, thought process behind his pits is something else, <laughs> even down to the insulation firebox and his techniques with that, um, to his baffle systems, to his um, a few other aspects of his pits that I really, really do like. Um, and he's, he is a one-man band and he's quite hard to get hard of from time to time, being quite you know popular and busy. Uh, but it, it, it was well well worth the wait to get that trailer and um, we, we do love our pit. He has done a beautiful, beautiful job on it. Awesome. Um, awesome. You've, you've spoken a bit about some of the features like uh, direct flow versus um, uh, reverse flow and, and mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, insulated firebox. Are there any other features people should look for in, a, in an offset? Because, I mean, they all sort of look the same to the average punter. Uh, is there anything else to sort of consider in that? Oh, I, I'm, I'm more about um, quality over quantity. Um, there's definitely a few other pits on the market that you can buy a lot cheaper. And, you know, a solid is, um, it can be down to the size of the steel, and, which is heat retention. Um, I'll be looking for the quality of welding. So if the welding and manufacturing looks like it's um, really well done, then it will be well done. Um, paint is another big thing. Like it does, it, put it this way, you put a lot of heat through it and there's not paint out there that can last that kind of temperature. It will rust, it will fade, it will fall off. Um, but it's just um, a great example is Radar Hill. Um, you look at his pits. Some of the boys getting around their pits are you know getting on two to you know two years old now, and they still scrub up beautifully. Like they still look a million dollars. It's because he uses the quality paint. He uses the, he takes the time to prep them. He does it properly. Where there's a few of them getting around, um, like um, my twenty inch at home. My um, sorry, my old twenty inch. Um, yeah, the paint was quite quick to come off the firebox and um, and rust up quite quickly. Um, that's quite normal um, for a firebox, but the whole pit was actually starting to rust up a bit. It's just mm-hmm. it comes down to um, yeah, basically you get what you pay for. That's what I found. Um, and just ask a lot of questions. There's a lot of people out there now who are building pits and have. Um, have, have changed their ways. Um, look, Bully Ketter, he, he's from the version one we first got. We were actually his very first customers he ever had, I believe, um, to the pits he's been bringing out lately. Really have a chalk and cheese. Um, he's they come a long, long, long way. He's on for a lot of hard work. And I've actually sat down, sat down with him a few times and, you know, to help him on a few ideas I had about, you know, a smoker and how it should work and how I should look. And he is—he really took that on board, and he really has put them into his new style pits, and we're, which I'm really happy for. He has done. Um, it's just a shame that it wasn't something we were looking at the time when we wanted to, to um, get a trailer. So, to answer your question, yeah, I would. Um, it's personal preference, man. Um, 
ask around, do some shopping. Um, there, there's a lot of mods I, I, I like on certain kits and certain designs, but it's all preference. And you know, the next the next guy is going to tell you something totally different. Um, look at Double Barrel, um, for instance. They use a, a, a blow a BSG vertical and a Yoda pallet grill. So, you know, we can't split the difference between them on the table. Like we, after seven competitions in a row, we still can't get one point difference and we're doing totally different setups. So to answer your question, mate, it's um, personal preference. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. All right. So we've had our uh, questions there, mate. So which would you pick as being a, uh, a top question there for our gift voucher? Oh. Being controversial, actually, I'm going to go pit my ass the mic. I'm the balls to ask the question. Pit faster, <laughs> Mike. Nice. Nice. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, Chris, so for the final question, before I let you go, what would be your three top pieces of advice for new teams? So my three, tops, my three tips would be um, fire management. Um practice and practice and practice and have fun M- remember to have fun like it is a competition but remember that you know this is barbecue and everyone needs to you know, really embrace what you're really doing and have a lot of fun and we we as a team do, do, do enforce that and i hope everyone else does too Awesome. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's very easy once once competition gets involved to lose sight of the fun factor. But if you're not having fun, what's the point in being there? So correct. correct. Yeah, top top bit of advice. All right, I'm going to hand the mic over to you solely now, and give you a minute or two to give some shout outs and tell people where they can contact you. Um, like first, I'd like to thank um, definitely our sponsors throughout this year. Uh, I'd like to th- a big shout out to. Um, Susan and Terry from Super Butcher, they've been absolutely outstanding this year. We um, we um, could not have done this year without you guys. It's been um, a long haul and a lot of fun. Uh, also, the guys from Fortitude for your um, always cold beers. Uh, it's been absolutely amazing. Uh, Thirsty Merch, who's um, the guys who have looked after us throughout the year on our brand new logo uh, and our tents and our merchandise. Um these guys have been absolutely phenomenal and their clothing and range are second to none. Also, um, I'd like to uh, thank the boys in our team. Um, Jerry, who's now in Canada. Uh, Dan, Professor. And we've got uh, Dan Rawlings, the uh, parsley bitch, as we like to call him. And also Jolly, Chop Chop, um, our butcher, on team, in team butcher. Um, guys, it's been a great year and uh, – Really, really couldn't do it without you boys and look forward to next year. Um, if anyone out there really um, is, is looking for um, to get in competition, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I, I would I would never never look back and say I'd regret any moment of any barbecue I've been to. And um, look, we, um, we're, we're, we're easy to find. We're um, all over Facebook. We're all over Instagram. Um, we're happy to answer any questions that anyone wants to you know, if anyone's looking at getting to get into barbecue or, you know, worried about what they're doing wrong or that, you know, one of us are always there to answer questions and help you get involved and get into the low and slow scene. So thanks again, Ben, and uh, talk to you all soon. You're welcome, mate. So just to clarify, on Facebook, you're www.facebook.com slash... The Smoking Hot Bros. Awesome. And on Instagram, you are... The Smoking Hot Bros, in one word. Awesome. All right. Thanks very much for sharing your wisdom with us tonight, Chris. I think everyone here has had a great old time and awesome. uh, best of luck with the 2017 season. You've had a ripper of a year this year and uh, Thanks, bud. I got a feeling you're going to have a ripper of a year again next year. Let's see what happens. Look forward to it. Excellent, mate. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions.